Howdy, howdy. This is Lily from Makecraft Game, and you're listening to Reading Rulebooks. Today, we're going over the rulebook for broom service. Zooming brooms put potions in motion. Let's get into it. Game summary. Players become witches, druids, and gatherers, producing powerful potions and delivering them by broom service throughout the magical realm. Round after round, enchanted rivals choose four of ten roll cards. Each card has a brave and cowardly action. The brave actions are most rewarding, but carry grave risk of being lost to opposing players. The cowardly actions are less profitable, but safer. Which roll cards will you secretly choose? Which have your rivals chosen? Who will be brave and who will be cowardly? The winner is the player with the most victory points after seven rounds. Game contents. Two punch boards. For the basic game, 24 heavy clouds, 24 magic wands, one game summary for game variations, 15 amulets, 17 landscape tiles, 8 storm clouds. Before the first game, remove all the parts carefully from the punch boards. Parts with violet borders are only required for the variations, not for basic gameplay. One game board, double-sided, 60 potions, 10 pawns, 5 victory point markers, 60 playing cards, 5 times 10 roll cards, 10 event cards. Game setup, basic game. The board is placed in the middle of the table, face up, i.e. with the two castles showing reddish banners. Note the castles on the back side of the board show purple banners. Each player receives 10 roll cards of one color, two pawns of the same color placed in the two regions with the castles, one victory point VP marker of the same color placed on space 10 of the VP track, one potion of each color, and one or two wands. The oldest player is the starting player. The starting player and the player to the right, who it will be the last player of the first turn, each receive one magic wand. All other players receive two wands. In a two-player game, each player receives one wand. The remaining potions and wands, from now on referred to as resources, are placed in a general supply next to the game board. The game summary is displayed between the players. The front shows an overview of each round and turn, and the back summarizes the victory points received at the end of the game. The 24 heavy clouds, with white stars on the front, are shuffled and placed randomly. Face up one cloud on each corresponding space on the board. 18 spaces on the front side of the board, 19 spaces on the back side of the board. The 10 event cards are shuffled. Seven cards are placed in a stack next to the board and the remaining three cards are returned to the box without looking at them. The top event card in the pile is turned over. The event displayed applies to the first of the seven rounds. If there are fewer than five players, shuffle the 10 roll cards of an unchosen color and place them in a draw pile next to the event cards. Depending on the number of players, reveal the following numbers of bewitched roll cards. Two players, three cards, three players, two cards, four players, one card. Note the players plus the number of bewitched roll cards is always five. The remaining materials, landscape tiles, amulets, storm clouds, are required only for the game variations for advanced play, which we'll talk about in a later section. Gameplay. The game is played over seven rounds. At the beginning of each round, each player chooses four of their ten roll cards. Then the players compete for tricks, turn by turn vying for the actions on the selected roll cards. After at least four or no more than ten turns, all chosen rolls are played, the round ends, and the next round begins. Choosing roll cards. At the beginning of each round, all players simultaneously choose four of their ten roll cards to use this round. Exception event, more or less. Each player holds their four select cards and keeps them hidden from other players. The remaining six roll cards are placed face down and are not used this round. When all players have chosen their cards, let the magical competition begin. The starting player for the turn begins by playing one of their four roll cards, i.e. by placing it on the table and reading aloud either the upper text or the lower text of the card. I am a brave forest witch and I would like to fly to a neighboring forest, etc. Or I am a cowardly forest witch and etc. If the player read the top brave text, good but risky, the player claims the action. 
Since the action might still be stolen by subsequent player, the player does not yet perform the action, but instead waits for the remaining players to take their turn. If the player reads the lower cowardly text, less good but safe, the player immediately performs the action. For more details on rules and different actions, keep listening, we'll talk about it in a little bit. When the first player has finished, then the next player in clockwise order must follow the roll card that was just played. One, if the next player is not holding that roll card, the player cannot follow it, and so simply says, next, turn continues to the next player in clockwise order. If the next player is holding that roll card, the player must place it on the table and execute either 2A or 2B. 2A, the player reads aloud the upper text, I am a brave forest witch, and takes the brave action from the earlier brave player, if there was such a player. The earlier brave player is now out and gains nothing from that roll in this round, neither the brave nor the cowardly action. However, the action is not yet safe for the new brave player either, since there are still players remaining. 2B. The player reads aloud the lower text, I am a cowardly forest witch, and executes that action right away. The cowardly action is always weaker than the brave action, but it cannot be stolen. Thus, the cowardly action can be taken by any number of players sequentially. After all the players in clockwise order have had a turn, the player who last chose the brave action now performs it. This player becomes the new starting player and chooses a remaining roll card, places it face up on the table, and reads either the upper or the lower text aloud. For example, I am a cowardly weather fairy, and so on. Example. Albert begins the round and plays the forest witch by saying the words, I am a cowardly forest witch, and places the card in front of him. Then he moves one of his pawns to an adjacent forest. Bonnie follows. Since she has also the forest witch in her hand, she must also place it in front of her. She says, I am the brave forest witch, and must now wait and see what the next three players are doing. Clara also has this roll card in her hand and places it. She too is confident and proclaims, I am a brave forest witch. With that, Bonnie is out. The forest witch is lost to her for this round. Daniel and Emily follow. Neither of them have the forest witch and each in turn say next. The turn is over. Clara is the last brave forest witch. So she puts one of her pawns in an adjacent forest where it delivers a purple potion to a purple tower and she receives the victory point shown. Clara begins the next turn by playing a new roll card and proclaiming, I am a cowardly valid druid. She immediately delivers a potion to a free tower in the forest. Daniel then says next, because he does not have a valley druid. Other important rules. You may select an action even if you cannot or do not want to perform it. Similarly, you can decide not to perform an action even though you have the opportunity to do so i.e. to retain resources for a different role or event. For the witches, the following applies. A brave witch may move to an adjacent territory without delivering a potion there. However, no witch may deliver a potion without moving. A witch may stay and do nothing. The last brave player must start a new turn by playing a new roll card, even if the prior action was not fully or partially executed. If all participating players play a roll card cowardly, the starting player of the prior turn also starts the next. If the starting player does not have any more roll cards, the next player in clockwise rotation who still has cards becomes the next starting player. Duty to follow. Players must follow if they can. If a player plays a roll card that has already been played in an earlier turn of the current round, the player must place the card without performing an action. The played roll card should be played offset like a fan in front of each player, so that everyone can see which roll cards have already been played and how many cards each player has left. The most important rule when placing roll cards. Before it is your turn to place a card, it is forbidden to indicate whether or not you have the current roll card. Always wait until it is your turn before saying next or I am. Bewitched rolls are used in two to four player games. It is important to consider carefully these bewitched rolls before selecting your roll cards since anyone who places a bewitched roll immediately loses three victory points, whether choosing the brave or the cowardly action, and whether or not the action is performed. Notes: Losing victory points due to bewitched rolls and or certain event cards may force players to move their victory point marker below zero. 
When the draw pile of Bewitched Roll Cards runs out, shuffle all 10 roll cards to create the new draw pile. End of a round. A round ends when all players are out of cards. If only one player has cards left, the player plays alone until all cards have been played. Finally, complete the current event if it is an end of round event card. We'll talk about events in a later section. Then the next round begins. Place the next event card face up over the previous one. For two, three, or four player games, place the next three, two, or one bewitched rolls face up over the previous one. Players again choose any four of their 10 roll cards, setting aside the remaining six for the rest of the round. The starting player for the new roll card is the last brave player from the previous round, or the last starting player if all were cowards in the last turn. Game end. After seven rounds, the game ends. Each player receives victory points for collected lightning, see back of summary, and remaining resources. Score four victory points for each set of four different resources. Score two victory points for each set of three different resources. Whoever has the most victory points is the winner. If tied, the tied player with the most resources wins. If there is still a tie, there are multiple winners. Example, the player receives at the end of the game four points for the set of four, two points for a set of three, plus 19 points for their collected lightning, which is total to 25 victory points. The remaining three resources did not earn victory points because there are two potions of the same type, so they are not a set of three. The roles. Gatherers. Gatherers help players receive new resources. Resources are always placed visibly in front of players, so that they can be counted by other players at any time. Depending on whether the role is played bravely or cowardly, the number of resources taken from the supply is three or one. Note, the supply piles for the potions and magic wands are not meant to run out. Use placeholders if necessary. Witches. Witches, both brave and cowardly, help players move their pawns around the board. Brave witches also deliver potions to the towers, allowing players to earn victory points. Druids. Druids, brave and cowardly, help players deliver potions to the towers in order to earn victory points. Brave druids receive an additional three victory points. Delivering potions as a brave witch. First, the player moves one pawn to an adjacent area where the landscape type corresponds to the played witch. This area may contain any number of other pawns, but cannot contain clouds. Then the players choose one of their potions to deliver in the new area to an empty circular tower of the same color. If there is no matching empty tower, the player cannot deliver a potion. If an arrow points to the tower, the potion is placed on the tower and the tower is occupied. Finally, the player advances the victory point marker as many victory points as specified in the supplied tower. If there are one or two additional wands shown, the player takes the wands from the general supply to keep. The tower is now occupied and can no longer receive potions. Instead of a circular tower, a player can also deliver to a square tower if available. In this case, the potion is not delivered to the tower, but to the general supply. The square towers can be delivered to multiple times, thus they are always open for the entire game. When delivering to a square tower, a player also receives the victory points indicated by the tower. Each player may deliver only one potion per roll to the square towers. If an arrow points away from the tower, the potion is delivered to the general supply. Square towers can be delivered to repeatedly. Delivering potions as a druid. For a druid, brave or cowardly, to deliver a potion, the same rules apply with the following exceptions. No pawn is moved, but at least one of the player's own pawns must already be in the corresponding area. As a brave druid, a player receives three victory points more than the supplied tower specifies. These additional three victory points can only be received if the player actually delivers the potion. Just being brave is not enough. The location of a tower depends on which area touches its base. Thus, the four towers in the picture on page 7 can receive potions from pawns within the following areas. The left purple tower, forest, hill, or prairie, multiple times four victory points each. The central purple tower, hill or prairie, just once, six victory points. The upper orange tower, hill only, just once, 
five victory points. The lower purple tower, prairie only, just once, three victory points, plus one wand. The clouds. Pawns may not be moved onto or over water areas. They may also not be moved onto or over land areas where there are one or more cloud tiles. The player must first try to charm away the clouds with the help of the weather fairy. Note, lightning on the removed, charmed away clouds brings victory points at the end of the game. To charm away a cloud, the following conditions must be met. The player must place the weather fairy roll card and have at least one pawn in an area adjacent to the cloud to be charmed away. The player must return to the general supply the number of wands that match the number on the star on the cloud. The player then keeps the removed cloud, visible to other players. As a brave weather fairy, the player also receives three additional victory points. The player only receives the three additional victory points if a cloud is charmed away. Just being brave is not enough. The events. There are 10 different events. One event is revealed each round. Of the 10 event cards, one takes effect before selecting the rolls, three take effect during the round, and six take effect at the end of the round. The cards are self-explanatory, clarifying details are below. More or less, all players choose between one to five roll cards, hidden from other players, then simultaneously reveal the number of the selected roll cards and gain or lose the corresponding number of victory points. The round then plays as usual. Black Market and Black Distillery. A player can decide whether to take the action or the event each time the player plays a role cowardly. Perilous Places. Example, both of Daniel's pawns are in forests. He loses two victory points. Emily's pawns are in a prairie and a forest. She loses four victory points. Protected Places. Example, Daniel's pawns are on a hill and a mountain. He neither gains nor loses victory points. Emily's pawns are in a prairie and a forest. She moves forward two victory points. The upper hand. Each player announces how many resources they have to start. Then all players simultaneously take any number of their resources in a closed fist and hold it over the table. The fists are opened at the same time and the number of resources are compared. Empty handed. The resources are kept by the players. The works. Each player may only deliver a maximum of one set of resources. Flock together. The player's two pawns must be in the same type of area, but not necessarily in the same area. Game variation. Try the following variations, even combining some together. Introduce the storm clouds with light blue stars on the front, the landscape tiles, and the ambulance, as well as the back of the board into play. The storm clouds can be used on both sides of the board. At game start, mix the storm clouds with the heavy weather clouds. Then, as usual, place a random cloud tile on each of the corresponding areas. Return the remaining cloud tiles to the box. Those who wish may use fewer heavy weather clouds to increase the likelihood that the storm clouds are placed on the board. Two times. If this cloud is on the board, players receive two additional victory points when delivering a potion with a pawn adjacent to this cloud. If both of these clouds are adjacent to the pawns delivering the potion, players receive four additional victory points. If Emily, for example, has a pawn in an area adjacent to these two clouds and is a brave druid, delivers two victory point tower plus one wand, she receives two plus two plus two plus three, which is nine victory points plus one wand. This cloud is symbolized by a plus two symbol. This is the only storm cloud that always works while it lies on the board. All other storm clouds will work only once at the moment they are charmed away. The witch cloud times two. Players who charm away this cloud may immediately move either pawn to an adjacent space, just as if the player had placed the appropriate cowardly witch. The tower cloud one times. The player who charms away this cloud may immediately deliver any potion with either pawn just as if the player had played the appropriate cowardly druid. Potion clouds times three. The player who charms away this cloud immediately takes the corresponding number of victory points if the player possesses at least as many potions of the matching color shown on the cloud, i.e. at least three orange, four green, or four purple potions respectively. 
These potions are not returned to the supply, but are kept by the player. If a player does not have the required minimum number of potions when charming away this cloud, the player receives the cloud tile, but not the victory points. The mountain tiles and amulets can be used on the front side of the board and must be used on the back side. The five mountain tiles are shuffled at the beginning of the game, and then one tile is randomly placed face up on the corresponding space of each of the three mountain areas. Any towers covered lose their functions. The remaining two mountain tiles are returned to the box. Each player places an amulet of their color next to each mountain tile. When a player moves a pawn to one of these mountain areas, the player then, in any order, does the following. 1. Claims their amulet from the mountain area and keeps it visible to the other players. The amulets bring players victory points at the end of the game. One amulet is 4 victory points, 2 amulets is 9 victory points, and 3 amulets is 15 victory points. Use the complete function of the mountain tile without removing the tile. If a player does not want to use the tile, it expires immediately for that player, i.e. it cannot be used in a later turn, evident by the fact that this player's amulet has already been claimed. 3. If acting as the Brave Mountain Witch delivers a potion here if desired. The individual tile means 3 potions. The player takes 1 potion per color from the general supply. One of these three potions could be delivered immediately if acting as the Brave Mountain Witch. Two wands. The player takes two magic wands from the general supply. Tower. With either pawn, the player delivers any type of potion as if using the appropriate Cowardly Druid. Note, delivering to a square tower is allowed. Witch. The player may do up to two movements with one of their pawns, or one movement with each pawn as if placing the appropriate Cowardly Witches. Cloud. The player may charm away cloud tiles adjacent to either pawn, as if placing the Cowardly Weather Fairy. The forest tiles must be used when playing with the back side of the board. The six tiles are shuffled at the beginning of the game and then randomly placed face up on each space provided in the four corresponding forest areas. The remaining two forest tiles are placed back in the box. A player who moves a pawn to one of these forest areas takes the forest tile from the board and keeps it, face up, visible to everyone. In a subsequent turn, the player can use it once and then discard it face down next to the board. A player may use a maximum of one tile per roll card and one plus one card tile at the beginning of a round. Individual tile means card actions times two. Any player who plays a role cowardly and uses one of these tiles is allowed to perform the brave action instead of the cowardly one. For the remaining rules, the player remains cowardly. Thus, the player neither usurps the current brave player nor becomes the starting player of the next role card. During the event Braveheart, the starting player of a role card cannot avoid the obligation to be brave by using this tile. Plus one times two. Any player who uses this tile at the beginning of a round may take one additional card to keep. This tile can be used in the event more or less, even after all players have shown their hand size. The additional card is not taken into account when scoring victory points for this event. Action or point times two. Any player who plays a roll card cowardly and uses this tile takes five victory points instead of performing the action. If this tile is used during the events Black Market or Black Distillery, the player still gains only 5 victory points, and not another plus 3 victory points or plus any resource. The Hill Tiles must be used when playing the backside of the board. The 6 tiles are shuffled at the beginning of the game and then randomly placed face up on each of the spaces provided in the 4 corresponding hill areas. The remaining two hill tiles are placed back in the box. The individual tiles mean the witch tile times five. Any player who moves a pawn to one of these hill areas ignites the turbo broom feature, immediately jetting this pawn to one of the two stone circles specified on the tile. In the new area, the player may deliver a potion if playing as the brave hill witch. Note. It is possible that the stone circle B is not accessible, or that you can no longer leave that island after you arrive. It is never possible to leave the island with the stone circle D. 
Tower times one. In this area, no turbo boom feature is ignited, but a player can deliver an orange potion to the supply for seven victory points if playing the Brave Hill Witch, just as if the tower was displayed on the board. The same applies if any player delivers a potion here as the Peak Druid. And that is the rules for Broom Service. This is an extremely fun game that had a lot more to it. But before I talk a bit more about the game, I do want to point out one really interesting aspect of the rulebook, which is that when you're reading the rules, there are kind of two sets. There's the rules on the left, which are in purple, and the rules in right, which are bolded and in white. The rules on the right serve as a game summary to help you quickly familiarize yourself with the rules during subsequent plays, which I really appreciate not having to kind of like scrounge through all of the rulebook again. You just have these nice, easy reminders on the right side, which I feel like all rulebooks should have now that I'm seeing it in person. But I digress. This game is really fun and there's a lot more risk reward than I was anticipating. Picking the four cards, not only do you have to think, what do I want, but you also have to think, what do other players not want and how can I take advantage of that? Because if you can play four cards that no one else has played, you can get more actions just naturally. But there are times where your actions that you want to do, other people are going to want to do them. And that's when you have to decide between being brave or cowardly. Because if you're the first person to play the card, you don't know what other people are playing. If you're the second or third person, there's still someone after you and you don't know what they want to do or if they're going to do it. And sometimes taking the brave option isn't always the right thing. I have seen many players go cowardly even though they could safely be brave because they did not want to be the starting player. And that is completely valid. While you may lose an action now, you could gain an action later. And that action might be more important than the one you're taking now. There's just so much to think about in this game state that is really, really interesting. And I'm very excited to play this game more. Very happy that it was introduced into my life. I am kind of curious to see how the game variations change the game. There is a lot more being added in. It makes the game potentially more fluid or have more options just by moving to places where you can be cowardly, move to a place and get a bonus versus having to be brave to get that bonus in the first place. I also really love the idea of being brave or cowardly. It's like the one game where I'm like, I am proud to be a cowardly witch because you know what? I'd rather take the action than potentially lose it. And one thing that's so interesting to me is you're not gambling against the game, you're gambling against the other players. You're gambling, did the other players take this action? So you're constantly thinking about everyone's game state, which is really fascinating because this game has the vibe of a Euro, which typically I've seen it be more solitaire where I'm doing my own thing. I don't care about what you're doing, but in this game, I have to care about what you're doing. And that just adds kind of a layer of complexity of actually caring about other players, not because of what they could do to you, but also kind of because what they could do to you inadvertently. So yeah, that is Broom Service and I, I'm very excited about this game and to play it more. If you like what you're hearing, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe wherever you find Makecraft Game, and be sure to check out makecraftgame.com for more content. This has been Reading Rulebooks. I hope you have a great day, and I'll catch you next time.